Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is uh, to give you an update on a project we're, that we're calling Arches for Science, which is a project of the Getty Conservation Institute that basically tries to answer the question of once you have a handle on the kinds of tools that Joe just talked about, the semantic modeling, how to find and use a IIIF image, how can we kind of start to assemble those types of tools into something that approaches, we hope, um, sort of a complete data management system. Um, I should mention before we dive in too deep, that of course I'm uh, speaking on behalf of a collaborative group of authors, who, which you see on the screen there. Um, and I also wanted to mention that specifically my colleague Dennis Withrich uh, of our developer, Fairline uh, Geographics, is here on the call with us um, to answer any technical questions you guys might have about what is about to be a lightning fast um, preview of what's in Arches for Science. So those of you that have heard about this project um, may know it from some work that we did uh, about five-ish years ago now, where basically to start thinking about digital data management and how to build a management platform, we started by going um, and having site visits at a number of organizations and institutions and individual researchers, um, notably on both sides of the Atlantic, to try and get a sense of what folks' uh, research and data management needs and desires truly were to make sure we understood the scope of the field. I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail, <clears throat> but you can see on the right side of the screen there, um, a bunch of the sort of types of institutions, types of work, types of projects um, that we tried to have sort of uh, represented in this uh, group while keeping the number of site interviews relatively uh, tight. So what did we learn from all of the interviews we did? <clears throat> this group won't be surprised to hear that regardless of sort of the size, scope, scale, and um, resources of researchers and cultural heritage, we all fundamentally kind of want the same things. That is to say, we want to be able to use data. Um, we want to be able to interpret data, whether our own or other people's. We want to be able to reuse it. We want to be able to make comparisons between objects and develop correlations between objects over time between institutions, all of that kind of data sharing and data use kind of material. But on that note of data sharing, there's, we also heard quite a common refrain that there's a lot of concerns around what access means for the types of objects we all study. Um, so we have a lot of um, comments that we heard about the need to control access, whether that means um, understanding who can see what pieces of data, uh, determining who, whether a, an entire institution is sharing all of their scientific or cultural heritage science data or only some of it, whether they're sharing sets of data with a uh, specified group of people or the public, that kind of thing. And it was really important just given the uh, cultural sensitivities around some of the data we work with um, that those processes, those access processes be able to take into account just different institutional and cultural practices um, and policies. The other thing we heard pretty consistently is that the fundamental sort of pain point or pinch point before being able to really fully address data use and data access questions kind of came down to data management. That is, we heard um, that uh, many institutions of, again, different scales and scopes have some, not all institutions have a uniform way of storing, finding, or sharing their own data, even within their own institutions. And so that if we could correct that and provide more tools for uh, data organization and management, we may be able to do things like enable data sharing, enable data mining, enable, enable more granular control over data access. And importantly, it would also probably potentially allow us to minimize data loss when something happens like a researcher leaves an organization. So if you'll forgive the metaphor, basically what we heard is we, we needed to spend a lot of time thinking about the sort of underlying plumbing of how we store our data to be able to do new and exciting things with it. So that's really what the GCI's project um, was trying to build out was that kind of underlying plumbing. Um, as you all have intuited from the discussion of modeling data that we just heard, one of the first steps to being able to better organize and manage our data, however, is understanding how to break down um, the idea of a conservation or heritage science project into constituent parts that you can build a data model around. So just as a very quick example, 
if we're talking about the types of studies where we take scientific data on a, an object of some sort, whether that's a painting like you see here, um, the Getty's fabulous uh, Jean uh, image uh, by Monet, or a sample mock-up, that kind of thing, the first thing to understand is that you need to be able to break that sort of idea or object down into some concepts. That is, this painting is a physical thing that exists in the world. It's part of a collection or more than one collection. That is, it's part of the Getty's uh, actual museum collection, but it may also be, for example, part of a man-made study set that was part of a larger project. The concept of a person is also kind of deeply embedded in a physical object in the sense that um, a person painted this. Manet, right? But it also depicts the person. We know the sitter for this particular portrait was uh, Jean de Marseille, who is herself a person. So you have to kind of break these parts of a project down into these constituent concepts. And you have to be able to do that for all the parts of a heritage science research project, whether that's the people that do the work, the instruments or scientific observations that we make, the samples that we may remove from a heritage object, and frankly, the metadata around how that sample is removed, the images, digital files, and spectra that those kinds of things that result from it, and all the uh, amazingly well-received digital products that we hope come from our work, such as publications and presentations. So all of that needs to be linked, but as we've said, it's not just those concepts, it's the relationships between them that need to be understood and modeled in order for us to fully capture in our management system uh, the intricacies of our work. So that's really what Arches for Science is trying to do. It's trying to build a platform um, that we can use to store, retrieve, visualize, and ultimately share our uh, data through management, basically. And one that does, in fact, capture all of those connections that we just discussed. Importantly, as again, you've already heard today, the, the whole uh, project of Arches and therefore Arches for Science <clears throat> takes into account the fact that this is all made extraordinarily easier by the use of standards and open source software, um, some of which you see here. So that can include things like an underlying semantic C.CRM, like Joe mentioned, controlled vocabularies, such as those from the Getty, uh, which we use extensively, and things like the IIIF, uh, image-based handling. And all of, using all of these means that our data will be protected through time and accessible, we hope, uh, into the future. The benefits of using a standards and open source approach are many, um, and everything that you see on the right side of your screen is important, um, but I'll let you read it while I talk. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of them for our purposes today. Um, one of those is that notion of sustainability and controlling things into the future. Um, it's critical, I think, to remember that one reason we're building all of this is to help make sure that the data lasts over time and remove the risks of things like institutional data loss. Uh, if we can reduce those risks, we also then reduce the need to reanalyze data, move objects to, say, a synchrotron for analysis, again, those kinds of things. We can help preserve our collections in that way. And the other thing, of course, is this idea of openness and community, that we believe strongly that we can get more out of the work that we all do if we can share our resources and data reuse becomes useful. So luckily for us at the Getty, um, these ideas and these tools are nothing new. There's a long-standing project here uh, called Arches, uh, which you can access uh, more information about here at archesproject.org. Um, it has tons of features, which I'm not going to get into for time, um, but What's important at a higher level is to know that it, it uh, contains a series of features that are kind of grouped into three major areas. The first of these is that it has a robust system for data import and data management, which is critical to what we're gonna try and do with heritage science data. It has a rich uh, discovery and searching capability built into it, including because of that semantic uh, standard underneath it all, the ability to search for concepts. And importantly, for the practicing conservation scientist, it has built into it uh, what we think of as workflows that make our life and the process of entering data much more straightforward. And I'm going to use the rest of my time today to kind of dive into that a little bit. So in short, uh, what have we built? What do we do? Um, we have created these workflows to help data entry for the most commonly encountered projects in the types of projects where you have a physical thing that we do science to. 
Um, we keep these as simple as possible. I'm gonna mimic uh, Joe's uh, framing and say, we do this in a way that hides as much of the complexity as possible um, because that just makes our lives easier. So we can do things like start a new project, select this workflow and start entering data in simple things that look like a website that you've seen before where you see a tabbed view at top. Uh, you can do things like enter the name of a project where you can uh, follow your institutional naming conventions to name the work that you're doing. You can see a couple of radio button and drop down menu types of data entry uh, areas where you can start building some of that metadata into the uh, work that you're doing. As we slide along this presentation, the next page of the data entry or the workflow allows you to, or provides a free text box where you can start to enter again, critical metadata for our kinds of work, such as for example, including the rationale for why a project was undertaken to help contextualize data for future researchers. We can also do things like add metadata about who worked on a particular thing. Um, I'm gonna dwell on this for just a second to point out that we can, this is where you really start to see the effects of bothering to do semantic data modeling, where you can do things like in this search bar, which you may or may not be able to see based on the size of your screen, but basically to add a person, I've started typing the first few letters of my own name, Catherine. And what you may see there is that two individual people named Catherine popped up and I can select one of them and link that to the project. And you might expect that to work. Um, but the other thing you can do is search on a concept because of the semantic linkages that have been built into that concept of person. Um, so that is here in this instance, I've started typing into that same search bar, the first letters of the word science. And what's popped up is a list of the scientists that work at the Getty Conservation Institute for me to select from. So you can search in a number of different ways. And that's true across the platform. You can add objects, say that man painting to the project in a very similar way. So once you've created a project, um, the next thing you might wanna do is tell somebody what you did uh, to that project. So you may need to, for example, define the areas that you analyzed. That's very simple. This is gonna look like something we've all done in many different software packages over time. It's an image of an object with some spots marked on it. But really what I want to mention here is that this leverages everything that we just heard Joe talk about, about triple IF manifests and everything that comes with that. All the rich metadata behind the image itself is being used here because this is a triple IF uh, system. Once you've uh, indicated your analysis spots, we can start to upload actual scientific data. Uh, so what that looks like um, is, again, just sort of the simplest data entry form we could come up with. In this case, the first step is to indicate whether this is the type of analysis where all we need to link it to is a discrete area on, a, on an object. Um, so something that you would do for a non-destructive analysis versus a second radio button that would let you indicate that this is something that you did on a removed sample so that we need to build in a link to a parent object, for example. Uh, going a little bit further into the non-destructive uh, data upload process, we get to then start to say, well, I created a project. Let me tell you which project this analysis was done for. The system will automatically feed us which objects, say paintings, are part of that project and let me choose from them, which we do. We can do the same thing with the instruments that were used. And then we are have the ability to do a, just a really simple drag and drop of files of spectral data, for example, into the system. Um, right now, we have this set up to read ASCII type data. Uh, so anything you have in ASCII form, you can drop here. So you can imagine dropping all 30 XRF spectra, for example, that you took from an object all in one fell swoop. Then the next thing the system allows you to do is to select areas uh, that you identified as areas where analysis was done, which you see being done for this painting here. And then of the, say, 30 XRF spectra I've just uploaded, select which ones are associated with that area. And just by clicking these little radio boxes, you're able to link a specific spectrum, a specific, specific data file to that analysis area. And of course, like I said, we heard that everyone wants to be able to dynamically look at their data. So we've built in viewers to do that. And I should note here too, that you may see here at the bottom right, the ability to include things like interpretations um, the file parameters, file specific parameters that you use for this specific data uh, piece of data, which become searchable and allow people to understand the data that they're looking at. So it's a, like I said, a lightning fast tour of sort of what we've been doing, what's coming next, 
Uh, we're in the final stages in this project of testing all of the data models that we have, testing those workflows, making sure they work the way we expect them to. And that will lead us directly into our first real implementation of the system, which will be here at the GCI. So, you know, be on the lookout for uh, one of us coming and telling you whether or not this works the way we intend it to. We also have a couple more workflows uh, that we're still working on, including things that would help us track modifications to things like uh, mock-up samples. So think artificial aging, that kind of thing. So you can keep data linked to a specific external event that happened to it. And workflows that will help us with reporting out the results of what we do. And of course, we're always looking for better ways to visualize and search the data once it's in the system. So I think we're definitely coming up on time here. So I'm just gonna stop there. Um, I just wanna thank everyone who was a part of what we've been able to accomplish to now and open the floor for, I hope, a few minutes of discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I will start asking something, uh, Catherine, um, about uh, who do you think should use or fill in data in Arches in the system? Um, the way we've been designing it thus far is for me to do it. That is to say, the, uh, con the practicing conservation scientist or heritage scientist, um, that we can do this as we go through the process of collecting data for a project. Um, legacy data, <laughs> that's a whole different question. Um, and every institution is going to deal with that differently. Um, but the goal is to make it a usable work rate tool. So you envision a situation where uh, you, you will have uh, somebody operating the XRF and on the same time having next to the desk a computer with the Arches on and typing in stuff, right? It, it could happen that way, yeah. Okay. That's the goal. And that way that hopefully what that reduces is the need to sort of try and go backwards and try and get stuff into a system after you've kind of moved on to your next project. <laughs> We're trying to ease that uh, particular pain point. And the system would have to be centralized because there might be different, many different people working at the same time on the same project, right? I might toss that question to you, Dennis, um, if you'd be willing to take that. Sure, thanks, Catherine. Um, so the system is designed as a web-based system, which means that you interact with it through a browser. Uh, and depending on how you choose to deploy it, it could be limited to uh, just an internal group of people. You could choose to expose it to external users or partners if you wish to, really up to you. But the point is, it's a web-based system. So uh, it's hosted on a central server. OK, thank you. That's clear. And the last question regarding this system is, uh, how much uh, effort in time do you think it's needed to go through, I mean, the routine work on filling the project? Uh, million dollar question. Um, <clears throat> I would say a lot of that is going to depend on familiarity. Um, you know, the first time I tried to enter data into our development uh, version of the uh, system, I was a lot slower at it than I am now. You know, um, now it's getting pretty easy. And so it does not take me any longer than it does to figure out where on my laptop I want to create a file structure to put the data in. It's pretty similar once you're familiar with the system. And I think the reason for that is this ease of use that we've tried to sort of emphasize throughout. We're trying to make it as easy as is possible um, with the complex types of data we use to get it into the system. Okay, so I will read, for, I'm not sure that you can read the chat. Maybe yes, because it's the chat and not the Q&A session. So Luca was uh, complimenting you about the tool and um, he's asking if there are plans in place to avoid that it will, it will be yet another nice tool for heritage content management. It's a good question. Um, I mean, the short answer is not yet because we haven't actually deployed it. <laughs> so we're going to have to use it and see what works. The hope is that, as I kind of started said at the beginning, that having this robust data management um, system in place provides enough utility in terms of being able to 
find our data in order to be able to share it, to be able to share it with its context, um, that it will just become so valuable to us as researchers to use that we'll want to use it. I don't know if you would want to add to that, Dennis, but. Yeah, well, I think that is really kind of the, the key point. I, I do want to also remind everyone that one of the key things Catherine pointed out in her, in her conversation was this idea of community. And we're really, really committed to building a community around the Arches platform for a very simple reason. And that is the technology on its own is just never sufficient. You need people to use technology properly for things to actually work. And so while we think Arches and Arches for Science are going to be really interesting, I think really, really effective technology tools, ultimately it's the building the community and connecting members of the community with one another to, for this to really be more than just another pretty tool. And we're, we're really, really focused on that. So just to, to there is also another question, but I wanted to ask you before, uh, you mentioned that it's a uh, browser-based, but it's a cloud-based or uh, it's locally installed in every institution separately? Uh, it can be either. You can choose to deploy it on the cloud uh, or you can choose to deploy it with your own network, within your own network. But I do, do wanna make, make this clear that you as an organization can choose to implement Arches and therefore you control uh, the way you deploy it and also the data that you put into it. Right. So you really maintain complete control of your own data. It's not, what it isn't is one, it's not one system where everybody's data goes into it. It's your own system that you can manage and really deploy as you see most effective. Okay, so I will read also another question here and then I think we should uh, wrap it up. Um, is the file parameter box text <coughs> or is it possible to use fixed metadata schemas for different techniques? Shall right. I take that, uh, Catherine? Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, so the, the simple answer is it can be either. What we've chosen to do is deploy the file parameter as a free text box for a number of reasons, but really all kind of all boiling down to that, that particular implementation best fits the needs of the Getty conservation scientists. However, if you want to use a more formal metadata schema for managing file parameters, you're free to do that. Arches does exactly what Joe talked about a, a few moments ago, which is provide you with semantic data modeling tools. In our case, visual semantic data modeling tools that allow you to define quite precisely the way you want to structure and model your all your heritage data, including metadata around files. So you're free to use kind of whatever you think best meets your, your own needs. Yeah, and I think that's just a really nice note to end on is that this whole system really is designed to be open source and adaptable. So each institution that employs it, if you want more specific data models for every technique, rock on, we can do that. Um, but we're in this, in the way we've built it so far, we just haven't made that choice yet. So it is customizable by each institution and your needs.